And that's really what buyer enablement's all about is, is selling through that champion. They're your surrogate uh, salesperson. Um, and, and, and I like to kind of pose this question to anybody in enterprise sales that's listening, which is, you know, who closes the deal? Is it you as the sales rep? We often say, oh, I closed the deal. Not once in your career have you signed the signature line for the customer. Only they can close it. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to B2B EQ. Today's guest is a startup enthusiast and serial entrepreneur. He's a buyer enablement expert who knows how to get to the core of what a buyer needs. He's mastered the skill of connecting with buyers on an emotional level and has a new definition of the importance of empathy and where it plays in the sales process. I'm excited to dig into it. Not only is the author of the book, Selling is Hard, Buying is Harder, but also the founder and CEO of Consensus, Garen Hess. Garen, great to have you on. Well, thank you, Tim. It's awesome to be here. I'm excited about this subject. I, I'm excited about it as well because you come from an education background, right? The teachers, I grew up, my mom was a teacher, wife is a teacher. And I just spent a good amount of time at uh, the SEC. You're probably familiar with Sales Enablement Collective at their Sales Enablement Summit. And it is a tough job. It is a challenge to get sellers to be enabled and yeah. to be successful. And education seems to be a common thread there. So really excited to tackle some of the topics around sales enablement and, and where EQ plays into all that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring up this connection of, my, of e-learning and instructional technology, which is my previous career, because it did have a tremendous impact on why I ended up where I'm at. And, and let's tell everybody just to kind of set the stage. So consensus, pre-sales is kind of the category or the, the, the topic you have on your website. Tell us a little bit about what consensus does, kind of how this all came to life. Because as a founder, it's got to be an interesting backstory. <laughs> yeah. So consensus is a demo automation software to help scale the pre-sales teams in enterprise software companies. So we automate repetitive overview intro demos often called harbor cruise demos so that it frees up time for the pre-sales team and sales engineers to do what they do best which is strategic consulting and deep dive technical demos proof of concepts they spend an inordinate amount of time doing these intro demos and it not only is inefficient to the tune of 30 to 60 percent inefficiency that's how much of their time they spend doing these intro demos but it's also demoralizing. No one, they're very intelligent, high, you know, very experienced experts in their craft, and they have to spend this much of their time just being the demo monkey, you might say, doing the demo over and over. And so we try to take that off their plate so they can focus. And that's what ultimately helps scale the pre-sales function from a scaling standpoint. And on the flip side, it also helps the buyers because buyers want to engage with personalized self-directed demos on their own early in the process before they ever engage with sales or as part of the sales process. So it helps move things along more quickly and the buyers consistently say it's a better experience as well. And it's interesting, you know, you talked about burnout and how you have very learned, very knowledgeable sales engineers giving like back to the basics, ones and twos and threes of the product type <laughs> demos. And, and I think you posted on LinkedIn recently, you'll have to rem remind me of the stat, but it was crazy to think it, most demos, like you said, don't go anywhere, demoralizing. And it was a, a trajectory of, what was it, burnout and, and poor oh, demos? Just or? recently, yeah. So yeah. there's this, uh, this study that we do with over a thousand participants every year yeah. called the Sales Engineering Compensation and Workload uh, Survey or report. And yeah, this, this chart basically shows that the more unqualified demos that a company deals with, the higher their burnout rate. Um, and so there's a strong correlation between 
uh, having un a lot of unqualified demos and uh, burnout amongst the sales engineering. So, I mean, and you asked about how I got into this and it really had yeah. to do with a feeling of burnout on my own in the sense that in my last startup, we were doing, we had too many leads, more leads than we could handle. And I was backing up the sales team. And one day I, I remember doing six demos of these, these overview demos back to back and just kind of Oof. personalizing each one for the new, whatever prospect it was. And, and, re, and, and I was exhausted and I, and I just remember sitting back and thinking, man, a computer should be able to do this for mm -hmm. me because this is ridiculous that I just did the same thing pretty much over and over for six hours straight. <laughs> And that, that was the beginning of, of, of the thinking about it, about that problem. And, and light bulb, because I've been at, at startups, it's almost every single buyer, if they're interested in the idea or the concept, they're like, oh, yep, let me see a demo. Yeah, exactly. That's the first thing. You go to any, yeah. any software and practically almost any technology site, whether software or hardware, the main call to action on their website is book a demo. So mm -hmm. if that's the number one thing you want them to do, and it's the number one thing they want to do, why don't you just help them get one as soon as possible? Whether, you know, it doesn't have to be on the website. Quite often it's the SDRs following up on something that they engaged with some lead form. But instead of waiting for the demo, you could say, well, let's book a demo. But in the meantime, you can watch one anyway. And then when we get to the demo, the actual appointment, you're already that many steps ahead and we can just dive into the specifics. I love it. And I also, I'm going to take this back to the the core thread of this, this show, which is EQ. And I think, you know, everyone talks about what's the EQ skills, like the human skills of a individual, right? A seller to a seller. But I'm almost thinking this is a high EQ product because you're, you're socially aware of the market going, buyers don't want to talk to sales. They want to get <laughs> educated, right? They, they, yep. You're listening to your market, you're hearing it and you're saying, okay, Great. Let's put a demo out there. Let's educate them in the way that they want to be educated and then lead them. Cause I've been on, I think it was play.consensus.com. I'll have to give you a shout out for that. I was having fun. And it does lead me to then say, Oh, I got the, the Netflix special. Now I really want to see how this would work in my environment. I want to talk to somebody. I want to talk to a trusted advisor. Right. And that's yeah. the ultimate goal yeah. of sales. Yeah. Yeah. It's goconsensus.com, by the way, just to be clear. But, but yeah, if you, if, if you ask a buyer what they want right away, it's not, I want to talk to a salesperson, right? And no. for a variety of reasons. In fact, Gartner has this really interesting quote where uh, they say, what buyers report they want is uh, information that is rich in technical detail and cannot be easily faked. Well, who is that? That's not the salesperson usually. That is the no. sales engineer or the solution consultant, whatever name they go by. So they want to speak less with salespeople and more with solution consultants. So how do you do that in a way that uh, meets the buyers where they are, not overwhelm the, the sales engineering team and so on? Um, mm -hmm. So it is it is really just trying to put more tools in the hands of the buyer to do what they need to do. Um, and and to some degree, as as we mentioned you know, this does require empathy because mm -hmm. you've got to understand what is it that the buyers actually need at this point. Um, and so there is this, there is this need uh, for empathy. And I have in my book, a chapter on buyer empathy. So, you know, I don't want to give it a bad rap. However, as I mentioned to you before we ever got on the, the recording uh -huh. here, I want to take a completely different angle on this if it's okay with you. Yeah. And I want to talk about toxic empathy uh, because toxic empathy. Yeah, it's, a, because, it's an interesting idea. Those words are very counterintuitive to, to what we think of when we think of empathy. Right, right. And it goes along with this thing called peace mongering, which is also something okay. you don't hear very often, right? You hear yeah. war mongering, like, oh, the people who want to go start a fight. But what about the people who want to go and start too much peace? Huh. That's what peace mongering is. Peace mongering is ultimately uh, being more interested in how people are feeling than in helping them progress in the way they need to progress. And the way this ties into B2B sales um, and B2B in general is, is in my opinion, in leadership. And so, mm -hmm. it, and I'll tie this back into the e-learning world. So back in the e-learning days, it's a lot about educating for the purpose of skill development. Um, it could be a hard skill. It could be a, 
a soft skill that you're developing and as corporate training is kind of the focus that where we where I was focused. Mm -hmm. um, and and buyer enablement and demo automation in particular is really just another type of education, but it's really for the purpose of helping them to make a confident, effective purchase decision and, and get the value that they need. So in that way, they are related. And that's kind of where my experience led to that. But here's mm -hmm. here's the rub with with sales in a way that's quite different from the whole e-learning world. Um, in sales, what you're trying to do ultimately is move somebody from a place of status quo to a place of complete and utter change. And it's not just them you're trying to get to move, but you're trying to get the entire organization to move quite, mm -hmm. quite frequently. And this means that you're going to lead them through a massive amount of discomfort and pain. And what is with the skill that is required most to lead people through discomfort and pain is leadership because nobody wants to really do it. And leadership at any level can be mm -hmm. defined as a willingness to be disliked and lead people through pain and discomfort to an outcome that is better for everybody. Right. This is how I would define the most effective leadership. But it's not it's not a definition of leadership that is probably touted very much these days, right? Because these no. days it's more about touchy feely, make everybody feel good, make everybody want to follow you, make everybody, you know, the top ten things you should be as a leader, you should obsess over those because if you're not, you're not a good leader, this so on and so forth. And I would argue that while some of those things can play a role, they are all subservient or should be subservient to the number one thing, which is how do you challenge the people that you're leading to do the difficult things they need to do, the painful things they don't want to do to get a better outcome for them in the end and for, for you and the, and the organization you're leading. Mm -hmm. And and you can look at this at a high level or you can look at it at a micro level with an individual enterprise B2B sales rep who's trying to lead that prospect who presumably wants to make a change of some degree. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking to you unless they're just tire kickers, but they probably don't realize the big painful experience they're in for. And here's where mm -hmm. the empathy problem exists. Really good salespeople have a lot of empathy. And so they're able to intuit a lot about what does the buyer need? What is the buyer feeling? Mm -hmm. But if you are overly interested in what they're feeling rather than where they actually need to go, you are likely to avoid requiring of them the difficult things they need to do to help effect change inside their organization. So I made this post a little while ago about, do you have a champion or a cheerleader, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and there's an example of just one that always sticks out in my mind. Um, I worked with a, a, a enterprise sales rep who had a leader that would meet with him every two weeks for over a year. And never made any progress. And the one thing that they wanted, he wanted this, this contact to do was introduce me to your boss, right? That was the, mm -hmm. the thing. And, and every time he, the, the guy would say, yeah, I'll get to that at some point, you know, just needed this or that, a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And the sales rep was just willing to continue to meet and meet and meet. Um, and that's just one example. But what does the buyer actually need in that situation? You know, mm -hmm. what the buyer really needs in this situation is for the sales rep to exert leadership. And yep. exerting leadership means, buyer, I am going to ask you to do what you don't want to do, what you're obviously scared to do. But if you don't do it, you're not making any progress. I'm either going to cut you loose or you're, you're going to do it. And so I, I like to try to encourage uh, people to think of themselves in sales role as buyer coaches rather than salespeople. You're really trying to coach them. You're like the Phil Jackson on the side sidelines coaching, you know, Michael Jordan and his team. And your Michael Jordan is your point guard, is your prospect, your buyer. They've got to go sell internally to all those other stakeholders. You can't go do it for them, but you can coach them. But you better be ready to ask all the hard things of them. And again, this is where the empathy gets in the way is so many sales reps, I hear them ask this question, well, what do you think is the next thing that we should do? And they actually, the sales rep actually probably knows what really needs to happen, but they don't want to challenge or require a commitment or hold their feet to the fire. And if they don't, the prospect's just not going to make the progress they need to make. 
and I think a lot of it comes down to the fear of rocking the boat. I don't want to be disliked. I'm afraid I might come across as overbearing or whatever it might be when the reality is the buyers not only need that help, but they won't trust you unless you give them that kind of strong leadership. They won't trust you as much. It, it makes sense, but especially your analogy of the coach, because when you were explaining this, I was thinking the personal trainer, right? That personal trainer that says, hey, I'll, I'll coach you every day, but you need to be here at 5 a.m. If you're not willing to show up. Right. I, I can't do the push-ups for you, right? Like, right. Can you imagine and, and if you... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's a great analogy, right? I mean, imagine if you showed up with your personal trainer and the personal trainer's like, uh, you know, what do you want to work on today? And you're just, and you're just like, oh, I don't feel like doing that much. Like, it's fine. No problem. <laughs> just do, you know, do a couple of push ups and we can have a nice conversation for the rest of the time. And right? would They're you not pay them? Yeah. No, yeah, no way. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't even respect them. Right. Exactly. Uh huh. Yeah. And so what is, what is this? That That's a great analogy because personal trainers are really good at having empathy, but not letting it get in the way. They don't let empathy become toxic. Yep. Meaning yep. it's toxic when it prevents you from helping those you're trying to lead make the progress because you're overly concerned with, I'm asking them something difficult. I'm going to make them feel uncomfortable or it's going to be painful. When it, it ties back to, I think like you see deals and so often it's the sales leader going in the forecast. Are you talking to the right person? Because you're talking to a lower level person and maybe they don't have the ability to affect that change or hold enough departments accountable to make right. the change. They don't the have enough influence somehow yeah, yeah. in the organization. They're super excited to do it. They're willing to show up at 4 a.m. But it's like, you might be, but I need them to be. And that's yeah. where it's always, I feel like, so tough, that idea of how do we get the right people in the room and then, like you said, get them all willing to go on that marathon with you. That's tough. Well, and, and, and speaking of getting all the right people in the room, yeah. it's, it's very unlikely you're ever going to get them all in the right room, I mean, in the room today. And, and so my take on it is that what you have to do is e equip and coach the champion to go do that for you. Because uh, they're going to go to try to sell internally. They're going to go try to affect change internally. Do they have the tools to do it? And that's really your job is to equip them, help them engage and discover those other stakeholders. And yeah, if you can get them to talk to you directly, you're fantastic. But usually you can't. And so the, the, the question is, how do we most effectively equip them and enable them to do it? And that's really what buyer enablement is all about is, is selling through that champion. They're your surrogate uh, salesperson. Um, and, and, and I like to kind of pose this question to anybody in enterprise sales that's listening, which is, you know, who closes the deal? Is it you as the sales rep? We often say, oh, I closed the deal. Not once in your career have you signed the signature line for the customer. Only they can close it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not taking anything away from you if you say you close the deal because you're good at getting them to make the signature. But there's a fundamental difference in the way you think about how you go about selling. If you if you accept the fact that the only people who can close the deal is the buyer and the only way they're going to close it is if they go get those other stakeholders involved and 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 are effective at engaging them and and drive, you know, and and closing it on their side. Well, and, and to that point, often the champion is not the person closing the actual deal. Like True. often, even the champion is somebody who's built the allies, built the use case, built the business case with the yep. seller. And now yeah. we've presented. They can't even close it. They're, they're yeah. the ones selling it. And so who's in charge of the selling? In a lot of ways, it's that it's that champion. Mm -hmm. So how do you help them be good salespeople inside their own organization and on the flip side, who's really in charge of the buying process? It ought to be the sales reps inside the vendor organization because they're the ones who have helped buyers through this process. But that does mean that you've got to exert leadership. I've taken, yeah. you know, as, as, a, as a community, we've taken, as a group, we've taken, you know, Mr. Prospect or Ms. Prospect. I've taken, we've taken thousands of people through this journey of making a purchase decision. Here's where we need to go. Here are the pitfalls you're going to run into. Here are the steps you need to take to be successful. And I need to take on my side and you've got to take them on your side. Will you take them? And when will you take them? 
All right, this is this is the 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 approach that the best B two B buying coaches, I will say, uh, you know, take to be effective. Well, and, and you say, you know, toxic empathy, and I love that phrase because it, it does, it fights against the counterculture or the, the current culture of, oh, empathy and sales, and that's critical, but the EQ piece still plays in because empathy is kind of just one aspect of it. The ability to be that socially aware and that self-aware that you're not just giving up your position and that you're actually holding that buyer accountable and doing that in a in a way that still keeps the relationship is tough. Yeah, it is tough. And this is, and this is why I advocate this model. Here, here's the basic model. It mm -hmm. is, you make a strong recommendation. Okay. And this is what, it, this is the model for coaching. I would say yep. you make a strong recommendation as to the step that that, that champion needs to take. And it might sound something like this. So Mr. Champion, mm -hmm. Uh, at this stage in the buying process with companies like yours in this industry and size of company like yours, here's what usually has to take place for us to make progress. Here's what I've seen be successful. So the next step that I strongly recommend that we do is we do X, Y, and Z, whatever the step is. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to go do this or that hard thing? by such and such a date you know would you be willing to share that case study would you be willing to share the business case would you be willing whatever it is would you be mm -hmm. willing to share the pricing and then if they say yes then your job is to facilitate so the so the process is recommendation commitment and facilitation if, if they say no that's equally as good mm -hmm. we might not feel like it but it's equally as good because with the no you get to say Okay, well, tell me more about why you were not quite ready to commit to that. And uh -huh. then you've got a lot, you know, it's an information gathering moment, a moment of truth. And, mm -hmm. and it helps everybody make better progress because you, you actually figure out where you're actually at. But that's what, that's what would be my recommendation is it's make that strong recommendation about what are the next steps instead of asking the buyer, which is all too common. It's like, what do you think we should do next? What's the best next step? No, that's a terrible yeah. question. They don't know. They'll tell you something. They don't really know. Oh, we should buy. talk to Sally in, in this department or whatever else, because yeah. they'll name a second meeting and that person has no context, going to come to a, a blind first demo again, just like you're trying right. to the, avoid. <laughs> the buyer, the, the champion rarely knows what the best next step is. Yeah. They, they, I'm not saying don't ever listen to them. But you should have a strong recommendation because you've helped them go through this. And you're going to say, if you go do this, these are the likely challenges you're going to run into. Yep. And here's how you get through that. And here's the material I'm going to help you with. Uh, it could be an automated demo. It could be a case study. It could be a white paper, whatever it is. And you're going to take that and you're going to go do this. Uh, and here's what's going to happen. You're going to run into these issues, but I'm going to help you through that process. And we're going to have a successful outcome. And so it's, 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 exer it's, it's again, exerting leadership is what it comes down to. And the best enterprise sales reps do that is they will, they will ask their champions to do the hard things and require them or they'll, mm -hmm. they'll drop them. Yeah. Well, again, it goes like some of the deal cycle lanes. You start seeing those go out so long in B2B sales right now. And, and if it, my feeling is that's a, you know, it's a symptom of. We, we've done some recent uh, surveys on, on buyers and sellers. And one of the things buyers said is, you know, I get, I get all this information on the product, but I get no real business acumen. I get no real consultative mm -hmm. sale of like, okay, yep. how does this really apply into my business and the value it right. creates? The use case, the value yep. is coming out of it. Seeing it yeah. actually come to life in their, in their place. So then, yeah, I'm not, I'm not running that marathon. I don't, I don't see what that finish line looks like for me. Right. It's not worth it to go yeah. stick my head out, you know, stick, poke my head up or stick my neck out. Uh, if I don't really understand what the value is coming out the other end. Yeah. And, and so I think that's also where you see a lot of people go to, okay, right away. I want to see a demo, but then I want to see a case study or I want to hear a story of a, of a person just like me who you solve this same challenge for. Right. So you've done startups before for, for not for our enterprise sellers, but for more of our startups in the market. 
maybe you're building proof points. Maybe you're first starting and building this, you know, kind of process for buyer enablement. Where do you start? So process for buyer enablement is, uh, depends on how much experience you have already in mm -hmm. selling into the market that you're in. But if you have enough experience, what you always should start with is mapping out the buying group persona map, which okay. is if I'm selling this product line to this market vertical with this segment, who are the different types of decision makers that get involved? What are their roles? Why do they get involved? When do they get involved? And by the way, your listeners can get some samples of these kinds of things like a stakeholder map download at buyerenablement.io. It's just a, um, a awesome. web page on our site that goes along with the book. So you can get free downloads if you want to see what these look like. And there's different levels to which you can build these out. But the first place to start is what are all these different stakeholders that have to get involved to make a purchase decision? Why do they have to get involved? And once you start understanding that deeply, then you start asking yourself, well, what kind of materials do they need to be able to get their tasks done or make the decisions they need to make effectively, these different stakeholders? What kind of objections or questions or concerns will they have? Um, an experienced sell seller will already know the answers to all these questions. And if you don't know them, if you're new to, to the organization or you're new to the sales team, somebody on your team is going to know this. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're in a brand new situation, like you've done, you're just in a brand new startup, well, you're going to have to just start going to try to try to sell and start taking notes. Well, who does get involved and start seeing trends and patterns, right? But the, mm -hmm. as soon as you can, you got to map out this stakeholder group, and then you start making a content matrix that basically says, okay, if I've got six different stakeholder personas that get involved, and let's say they, you know, two of them get involved in the early stage, two get involved mid, and two get mm -hmm. involved late. Why do they get involved? What kinds of content do they need to be effective and, and draw them to a successful decision? And how can I create that content in a way that, this, that the champion can deliver it to those stakeholders? So then you've got not only the stakeholders, but you've got a map of the content that you need to help every stakeholder get buy-in into the buying group and what they're objections and questions and concerns might be and actually write these down and write the answers to them and supply them to your champion. Like when, Hey champion, if you go talk to the CEO, here are the top 10 things they're going to ask you. Yeah. You don't want them going to that conversation blind. Right? So uh, again, it's a, it's a, having a deep understanding of the stakeholder group and why they get involved and how to help them educate them effectively. And then you arm or equip your champion with, all of that at the right times uh, so they're not overwhelmed mm -hmm. and, and then coach them through the process as they go, they go address it. So that's the, this is kind of the basic fundamentals of what I call is the, the deep sea buyer enablement framework, which is discover, engage, equip, personalize, and coach as is what that stands for, but is, is the basic buyer enablement framework. It's, it's really interesting because you're changing that whole idea of the seller being the channel to deliver that to the idea of the champion. And I'm, I'm thinking as a marketer, I'm going, okay, I got to simplify this even more <laughs> like this, this content, it's got to be even more bite-sized. Now it's got to be really digestible and clear and easy and concise personalized. And, and, and very, the, like I think, it's yeah, gotta be, they've got to, it's got to feel relevant to them and their role, their role in that decision-making process. Yeah. So you're right. So it does how, need to be consumable. Yeah. And, and when you're selling to an enterprise, what are some of the things you're seeing? So you do, you obviously your company's focused on the, the demos and, and automating that process, but what are some of the other mediums and formats that you're seeing work really well to engage? Cause I think engagement is so tough right now, keeping and, and earning the engagement of those buyers. Well, I love uh, research. I, lo I love data informed mm -hmm. answers to these kinds of questions. Um, and Gartner did this re great research a few years ago where they asked the question, you know, of 20 different types of information that marketers, in this case, it was about marketers, enterprise mm -hmm. technology company vendors could provide you which ones are most important. And then they stack ranked them, right? And these results. And, 
and the study itself is interesting. I mean, the full results, but the ones I like to focus on are the top three. And mm -hmm. number one was demos. Number two yep. was social proof or case, you know, case studies and other kinds of social proof. And number three was uh, ROI assessment tools and support. So, I mean, you think about it, they want to be educated on how does the product or solution actually help me? Mm -hmm. How do I know that I'm not going to be the guinea pig? <laughs> you know, and, and other people have had success. And then yep. what's going to be the financial benefit, right? Which kind of obviously you, when you look back on it. Oh, that would be the, that seems like it should be the top three things. Well, indeed they are the top three things in those order. And so what I recommend when I'm talking to teams about, you know, where do I get started in terms of content? Those are the three things. It's like focus on getting them the demos they need. And there's not just one type of demo and you can go out to goconsensus.com and look at, just search for six demo types and you'll find a whole a slew of information about more on that subject, but get them the demos they need at the time they need it. Get them the case studies and the social proof they need, which could be in the form of references or G2 or Captera or those kinds of things as well. Um, and then make sure they have the ROI analysis and don't wait for them to bring this up. Like lead them, lead them through this. First, we're going to educate you. Here's how the product solution, here's the benefits you get, here's the value you're going to get. Oh, by the way, here's a, here's a case study and some references you can refer to perhaps, or, and oh, you know, at some point you're gonna have to make a business case. So here's a whole pre-formatted business case mm -hmm. uh, template that you can use. And, and here's how you could potentially think about it, right? Um, so, th so those are some of the key things that, that I like to, to help uh, beyond just the demo that, that research suggests are, are highly effective with buyers. I think those are great takeaways and a, and a good place to start or even during times like this is the ROI assessment talking to like current economic challenges. Are, are you absolutely maybe it's not how much growth because they're not seeing that upside potential. It's how much can I save or how much can I reduce in, in this or that um, and kind of developing that. I'm curious on the ROI thing. I, I really I've always been jaded by the ROI calculator. I don't know if, if you feel <laughs> the same. But I'll say that there's probably some people turning on, on turning off this podcast going, no way. Um, but I've always felt jaded as a buyer. I'm like, that is for the unicorn situation in the perfect world. Like, have right. you really met my situation, my data, right. my challenges? No, you're not alone in this. And most uh, data shows that most buyers mistrust the the calculations that come out of ROI calculators. So. Mm -hmm. Speaking of empathy or, or EQ, it's it's really important to to understand that when you go into these kinds of things. But it doesn't mean they're not useful, yeah. because what what you're really trying to get at are what are the levers and dials under the big numbers that create value. And mm -hmm. so it's not as much about the number that comes out, because invariably the number that comes out of our ROI calculator is like you got to be kidding. There's no way I'm going to get a 29 X return on my investment. Right. Yeah. My personal trainer, is. I'm going to have arms like Arnold, right? Same thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In three days, you know, uh -huh. just, just do this for five minutes a day. And in six weeks, you'll look like this ripped guy. <laughs> um, it's like, no, I don't believe you, but you yep. still can't help but watch the video anyway. Right. True. But, <laughs> but so there is value in the, and the reason and so there's a couple of things I just want to say on this because um, yeah. we use ROI calculators all the time in every one of our deals because this research shows buyers need them. Now, do buyers blindly take the ROI calculations and turn around and show them? Not usually. But what it does is it creates a detailed uh, framework around which you can have a conversation about what are the underlying premises upon which value is created from this solution. And in what proportion do they add, do they contribute to value? And, and it makes both sides of the equation, both sides of the table, think deeply about these questions. And, and so I think on this topic of overinflated ROI numbers, yeah. um, and I'll do a little shout out to an ROI tool we like to use from the ROI shop. Um, and Michael Farber over there, who's the founder, we really, we've used his tools for five years now. And, um, one of the things he put in there from the beginning was a uh, an adjuster. Like, uh -huh. oh, this this these results are too high. Let's knock it down by fifty percent. So, because you can go in and ask the buyer, give us your assumption on this, your assumption on that, assumption on this. Wow, look at this! You're going to spend twenty five thousand dollars on this solution and get 
a $9 million return. I was like, mm -hmm. no, that's just not believable. So, you know, let's knock that down by so much percentage. And so they, uh, one of the things we like about it is just the, the ways you can kind of tweak the results that can make it feel more, even if this is off by orders of 3x magnitude, there's still, you know, still going to get a, a return. I like I like the way you frame that because I think in that context and talking about the dials and where you can control the like you know ah, I can tweak this or I can tweak that it's it reminds me of the same thing with sales math right anybody who's been in a go to market team's done the math of okay well if I have a twenty percent conversion and this is the cost of acquisition like just the rough numbers and most of the time that's never how it's actually gonna work right right. But it kind of does give you that ability to almost put the the controls out there and kind of tweak it and see what dials you can turn. Yeah, and you start to understand what are the what are the levers mm -hmm. that make a difference in the ultimate equation, mm -hmm. and and it and it helps you understand even if this number is way off, is it can it is it still contribute to something believable? Mm -hmm. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, speaking of things that are making a difference, we're sitting here and. AI has been for the last few months, I would say a, a craze. We don't have to hit on, on that topic in general, but what excites you about B2B sales kind of moving into the future? Well, I mean, I, my head is always in the buyer enablement mm -hmm. space because sales is all really should be about how do we help the buyer move from point A to B to C to D to you know, Z ultimately and getting there as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And I think AI has a ton of opportunities uh, to play a role in this space. Um, everything from uh, AI that can assist the buyer in initial evaluation of different selections or, or imagine submitting, I'm, I go on a website and I'm looking at a, a company that has a, five product lines and I've got a complex solution, typically sales engineers are going to have to get involved to give a potential recommendation. But I could pose a question to AI and say, here's my complex set of needs. Does this vendor have a set of solutions that could be organized in a way to meet those needs? So I think there's some really interesting things, you know, that could help initiate the conversation really effectively drive a lot of interesting data for both the sales engineers and the buyers. Uh, along those lines and, and help move the process along in in sort of the discovery area as well. So I think there's, I think there's some really interesting things that can be done there. Uh, so that's a lot of, about where my head is at uh, in, on the buyer enablement side is, is just how do we help the buyers move more quickly through um, evaluation uh, stages and tasks. Well, and I, I, I like your view because to me, it's, it's a human assisted process still, right? It's people still buy from people. Yeah. And there was a, a Gartner stat that was like, when you're just doing online sales, especially like if I'm just self-service, the buyer remorse was massively yeah, higher. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And it was super no. fascinating because people always challenge like, oh, are we just going to get rid of sales? Like to your point, AI, it'll give me an answer, but... I don't think we will. I think there's a trust factor in a human piece that's not going to go away. There is for sure, especially in complex purchases um, mm -hmm. where where the solution is is not a very simple. You know, simple one user purchases. We don't we don't necessarily need a salesperson, but you get in really complex implementations and things like that. They're going to want to build a relationship because they're not just buying the solution; they're buying the relationship with the company. And they mm -hmm. want to know they have this trusted partner to help them get through you know, the full implementation, adoption, and all of that comes after that. So I agree with you 100%. And this is where kind of going back to e-learning early on, everyone said, oh, learning is going to be fully automated. You know, no more need for corporate training. It's like yeah. there was a big panic. Oh, all corporate training is going to be out of a job. No, it's not true at all. However, a hybrid approach where some things are automated and some things are not is has proven to be the best of both worlds. And I think we're going to see the same in B2B sales and technical selling. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think we'll find, you know, I always thought the the SI vendors were on a last call and I was talking about, you know, you always had to sell the customer and then you had to go, whoever was going to be the system integrator, you had to go sell them on the same idea after that, because otherwise you're never going to get it to change in the organization. Right. 
And I feel like now almost the seller is going to have to elevate themselves to be like that system integrator in a lot of these maybe smaller deals where they're not involved because I'm seeing a lot of sellers get into the weeds with how they integrate, interact and, and put so a product true. together. So really fascinating. I think, uh, Garen, you're in a space that is just going to absolutely excel in the next few years. And I'm excited to not only learn more about consensus, but see where it all goes. So on that note, kind of tell me a little bit of your, your background and, you know, before consensus and just kind of some of the things that you've got going on today. Well, you know, my background, uh, just broadly speaking, was in, I was a computer geek growing up. I, I lugged around my 26 pound portable computer back in <laughs> high school. That'll date me, but that's what, that's as early as I got into it. And, uh, and then I love teaching that eventually got me into kind of the best of both worlds, which was the e-learning space. And that's where my initial technology startup was. But I really love using automation to do the things that we, that, that humans don't need to do so that humans can lead a more elevated, meaningful life. And again, this goes back to what we're doing in pre-sales, which is automating those overview demos mm -hmm. so that pre-sales can spend more of their time doing what they love to do and what they're uniquely good at. And so when I think about just the, the things that I love to focus on, it's really all about that. It's how do we use automation to automate the things that we should so that we can all live more meaningful lives. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think that's, that's what's, that's, what's most, most interesting. But, um, you know, I, I was speaking of Gartner, I went to their, their technology and growth conference last week in San Diego. And it was very interesting to mm -hmm. see their a major focus on buyer enablement and interactive demo automation platforms and, and how to be more efficient. Everybody's talking about efficiency because they're trying to reduce mm -hmm. the cost of sales right now. Right. Yep. Uh, because of the economic climate and, and as difficult as these kind of economic downturns are, they always lead to innovation that makes the whole process better for everybody. And so my, you know, my encouragement for companies listening to this podcast is lean into this, right? If you think mm -hmm. about Seth Godin's the dip, the people who who gain the most when they run into the dip are those that lean in. Lean into these things, see it as an opportunity to become more efficient, do more with less. That's what everybody's saying, but you know, instead of being complaining about it or you know, water cooler talking about how bad it is. This is an opportunity to uh, make a massive change for the better. And those companies that lean into it will come out of this period much stronger. I, the economy is pushing us to do a few more pushups, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a few more work in, a little more work in. So very nice. Well, Garen, where can people connect before we finish up? Um, where can they find you? And uh, please share any other links to your podcast, blog, book. There's all kinds of great content out there for people. Well, thank you. I appreciate the, the opportunity to do that. So first of all, if you want to learn more about consensus and demo automation and how to scale pre-sales effectively, you can go to goconsensus.com. You can go see a demo, no surprise, out there right away, you know, immediately if you want and engage with lots of other uh, really, really good content, especially in the pre-sales uh, thought leadership space and buyer enablement. Um, also, if, if you want to connect with me personally, I always welcome a personal connection on LinkedIn. So you feel free to, to reach out there. I'd also just encourage any sales leaders or pre-sales leaders that are listening in to uh, go join our Demo Fest community and uh, conferences where we have the largest conference and community focusing on pre-sales on the planet. And, uh, and so you can find that just at demofest.com. So those are just a few places that might be helpful for your listeners. I love it. And if you didn't hear it from Garen in this whole episode, stop the monotony of demoing on all of these things all the time when people really aren't that interested. Save the demo for the good stuff. Automate the rest, right? And, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Garen, thank you so much. It was great to have you on. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Well, to our guests, I uh, hope you learned something on this episode. I know I did and uh, can't wait to see you next time on another episode of B2B EQ. Give us a follow, give us a like, catch us anywhere you uh, watch uh, or listen to your podcasts. Thanks again. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.